Welcome back to yet another episode of Tuba People TV, where we talk about Arnold Jacobs all of the time. Gary Ofenlock, nice great to see, to see you. you. Good to see you. My Gary pleasure. Ofenlock, uh, principal tubist of the Utah Symphony for how many years now? Oh, this is 31. Wow, that's amazing. I remember that audition. Um, and also, uh, shortly after I left Northwestern, you were uh, professor of tuba at Northwestern. Yeah, 1987. I've one year, and then I decided to go back to with the, some of the advice of Mr. Jacobs to go back to the Utah Symphony because he said you're an orchestral player. You go back to do, go back to doing that. So well, it's so beautiful in Utah. It's all oh, it's day. lovely. I love it there. It's great. Well, what did you? Uh, when did you first encounter Jake? What brought you to, to Mr. Jacobs? Well, I'll tell you. The first time I heard him play was uh, let's see, what year would that be? I was ten years old. Wow. And I had just started the tube in the fifth grade. Uh, and we had gone down to the Chicago Orchestra Hall to hear the orchestra play. Every fifth grade class each year would go down to hear the Chicago Symphony. Hmm. And I had just started the tuba. Now this was what would probably be early, very early 60s. I'm not giving away my age there. Right? And you know, I had just started, so I couldn't play. And I heard this amazing tuba player. And I, and, and people say, well, you know, when did you know you wanted to be a tuba player? And when I heard him play, I said, this is what I want to do. As a 10 year old, I knew that that's what my life was going to be. I just thought this was the most amazing thing I ever heard in my life, hmm. hearing an orchestra for the first time. And then you think, well, all, all brass sections play like that. But really, in the 19, well, 50s, 60s, 70s, there was only one brass section that played like that. That was the Chicago Symphony. That's quite And probably that's right. could very well be true today also. So when I heard him play, and uh, then it was many, many years later before I got a chance to finally meet the gentleman. What, uh, so how, uh, when was that? What year was that that you, uh, that you entered his studio? Uh, I believe, well, the first time I played for him was at an audition for Civic Orchestra. Okay. And I was a junior in high school, and uh, I didn't know that. I had played in Chicago Youth Orchestra, mm -hmm. so I had a very limited orchestral repertoire. I loved playing in the band because you got to play all the time. Of course. We all did back then. And um, there were three excerpts that I knew. I knew 1812 Overture, mm -hmm. I knew De Singer, and I knew Lohengrin. And those are the three excerpts he happened to ask for me. Really? And I, I said, man, I'm in good shape here. Wow. So I played all of them, and I, I, I get to the Meister Singer, and I miss the high E. And I, 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 I could feel a little tear coming in my eye, you know? And he said, he said, son, that's okay. Just try it again. He said, everybody misses notes. He said, Mr. Clevenger will miss a note once in a while, and even Mr. Hurseth will miss a note. He said, you know, I'll even miss a note once in a while. <laughs> so I oh, okay. Yeah. So I played it again, and I missed the high E again. But... That was my first encounter with Mr. Jacobs, and uh, uh, I fell in love with that man at that moment on. He's mm. just the biggest influence in my life, and I was fortunate enough to get the nod to play in Civic Orchestra, and I got a, you know to, to work with him as a, as a teacher. It was it was wonderful. So um, you were in uh, uh, where'd you go to where'd you go to undergrad? Uh, well, that's a long story. I went to the New England Conservatory. That's right. But I was in high school when I was in Civic. So you had two years of of Civic. With Jake as a high as a high school. No, I'm my senior year in high school. Senior in high school, so yeah. one year. Yeah, and then okay. my first year of college, I actually wanted to stay working with him. Okay. So I, I went to a. I was going to go to Northwestern, but I came from a relatively poor family. We didn't have the money for it, and uh, I actually was at Northwestern for about a week. And Mr. Jacobs was trying to get me more money, and I ended up transferring out and going to a small school outside of Chicago, Elmhurst College. Oh yeah, sure. And I went to Elmhurst uh, for one year, so I could still study with Mr. Jacobs. Got it. And, uh, and then at the end of that year, uh, he had given me a call and saying, I got a call from Harvey Phillips at New England Conservatory. They really need another tuba player. Yeah. And I recommended you. And, uh, and I said, well, uh, first of all, I, said, I thought he said England Conservatory. Mm -hmm. so, that, so I told my parents, I said, you know, Mr. Jacobs recommended, I think I'm going to go to England. He said, that's where, that's where Bud Herseth went to school. And as soon as he said, but that's where Bud Herseth went to school, I said, well, that's where he went to school. And it turns out, and I called Mr. Jacobs, no, no, son, it's in Boston, Massachusetts. It's New England concern. Oh, okay. And my parents said, if this is what you want to do, then this is what you should do. I was a little concerned because I thought the fact that he thought I should move somewhere else, and maybe he just thinks I'm a lousy player. He's just trying to get rid of me. Right. But he said, no, there's a lot of opportunity there for you, and you really, you really should uh, work with Mr. Phillips. So then I was in Boston for that one year with... Uh, Mr. Phillips and he transferred to Indiana, mm -hmm. so I only had uh, Harvey Phillips for that one year. But it worked out very well for you in Boston, though. It did. It worked out yeah. great because I, I got there and um, I'd only been there for a year, 
and the guy doing all the work in town was a, was a young man that uh, named Paul Krzywicki. Uh -huh. And at the end of that year, he won a job in the Philadelphia Orchestra. Right. So now the Pops had an audition and play extra with the Boston Symphony, and there were three of us that they listened to. And uh, I remember playing uh, for the personnel, two personal managers, and Seiji Ozawa. I said, well, what, what do you want me to play for this audition? And he said, well, just the standard repertoire, no list. So I go in there, and I played for a half hour for, for Ozawa, and I just kept... I had only a C2, but didn't even have an F. Mm -hmm. and like, and I, I wasn't nervous, because when you're that age, you just play. You just play because you love to play. Right. So I'm walking off stage, and uh, they said, thank you very much. You did a very nice job. And then Mr. Osawa steps. He goes, no, no, wait, wait. I want to hear bead roll. I said, oh, how am I going to play bead roll on just a C2? But so I played the best beetle they'd ever heard, down a half step. So it's on a C tuba, so I'm playing C to G's instead of C sharps to G sharps. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And uh, he thought that was the greatest thing. So I'm walking off stage thinking, well, I pulled one over. The personal manager comes up and says, yeah, that was really beautiful. He says, next time play it in the right key. So <laughs> that's, that's my whole Boston, that, that's, that's my whole story of leaving Mr. Jacobs. But I stayed with Mr. Jacobs because I'm from Chicago. Yeah. And every time I would come through town, right. I would always... Uh, get a lesson with him up and up until right before he passed away. What what, what uh, was it that he, do you remember your first couple lessons uh, when you were in high school outside of the civic audition? Uh, you know, what, what was that like? What do you remember from that? Oh, I remember being just terrified. It was at his home. He used to teach in his home. It was mm -hmm. a very small room. And uh, did you study with him at his home? Or no. He was already in the, the studio? It was already at the studio. Yeah, yeah he, had, he was just his home, uh, south side of Chicago. And I'd get down there, and it's a tiny, tiny room, maybe eight by eight room, with every machine imaginable in there. In the basement. In the basement, mm -hmm. and um, uh, it was it was wonderful. I mean, I, he just every lesson you came out a lot better player than when you went in. And it was, uh, I do remember my first lesson, and he started talking to me, and and I'm just a kid now. I'm just a high school kid, and he had the vocabulary like nobody, you know, and not just regarding music, regarding physiology, anatomy, and uh, a, vel a very well-rounded man. And yeah. So he's talking, and I said, Mr. Jacobs, I have to be honest, I don't know any of the words that you just said. I don't know what they mean, mm -hmm. you know? And it's the only time I ever heard him, he said, well, son, I want you to pick up your horn and blow like a son of a bitch. Do you understand that? <laughs> and I said, oh, why? Well, yeah, I know what that means. So that was, that was the one thing I took away from that first lesson, and I, and I just finally learned how to breathe correctly. Yeah. And... And again, every lesson after that, I just felt like I would get better and better and better. It was, it was, and I'm sure the other people we've interviewed all probably said the same thing. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. A, it's a fairly consistent theme. Yeah. It, it, did you talk about uh, singing or, or uh, conceptual or buzzing or anything like that, would you? Well, yeah, we, we got into buzzing, buzzing the mouthpiece, which I had never worked on before. And I, I'm an advocate of that to this day. I, all my students do it. I still do it. Mm -hmm. It's my part of my routine. Uh, we did the breathing bag, which I don't do as much as I used to, uh, but I advocate that for all my, my younger students. Yeah. Uh, so we did a lot of buzzing. When I was uh, my first year in through my undergrad, I, I was a tuba major, but I was my first year in college, actually, I was a voice major. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, at Elmhurst, I was a voice major. Oh. So he didn't talk too much about singing because I was, I was singing in, in my, my studio there. Um, but, you know, a lot of the breathing apparatus, there was one machine... <laughs> That you were put in the corner of your mouth. I'm sure you remember when you, you inhale on it. Well, yeah. I was so I blew into it by accident. And he goes, "Oh, you're going to break my machine, you know." Yeah. And the other th one of the things I remember the first lesson, he had a machine. I'm not sure. I think it was produced by the Con Corporation. Okay. In his little studio, and it was a series of lights. Yeah. Yeah. And if you barely whispered, like one light would go on. And if you played at your top volume, maybe all five lights or however many lights, they would all go on. Right. So I want you to play the low B flat. I want you to. Watch the lights go up and then back down. Nice, even crescendo and diminuendo. And of course, you know, it's a little bit on, a little bit off and up and down. He said, well, I want it to sound more like this. And he played a note and blink, 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 blink. It's all about control. Yeah. And it just, wow. Now I want you to play this whole uh, Bordoni exercise. I want you to without lighting any of the lights. Okay. And then I want to go out. No, no, that's not good enough, you know. So I remember those lights. This, again, was my first lesson when you're just 17 or 16 years old. Ever old that was at the time you were... Uh, these are the things that stick in your mind. Well, that's great. Thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Gary, you mentioned that you were studying voice at Elmhurst College. Obviously, Jake knew about that. Yeah. And uh, you know, so much of, of, of what he was teaching was based upon singing in the head while playing the instrument. What, how did that affect you in your lessons? What did he talk about bringing those together? Yeah, he, he liked to 
to put words to pieces I was playing. I remember I was I was preparing the Vaughn Williams concerto, just the first movement, because all I had was a big giant con tube with a probably a 26 inch <laughs> bell on it, four short action pistons, and um, uh, and I was you know back then I'd never think of playing it on that. Horn. I couldn't play it on that horn now if I tried to, but back then it was well that's all I had, so you learned to play it on. And I said I want you to what would be the words that you would how would you put this to words? And I I didn't know what he meant. What are you putting it to words? He said. And I play. You know, I know it's marked piano in the beginning, but it's a solo piano. He said, so "You're the you're the you're the soloist here." So when I think of the opening of Vaughn Williams, I think, "Bum bum 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 bum, here I am." And those are his words for the opening of Vaughn Williams. So every time I play the opening of Vaughn Williams, my mind goes back to the 1960s, thinking, "Here I am." It's just starting the piece. You're saying something. Mm -hmm. You put words to it. So there were often times in lessons he would just say, "How would you how would you put words to this? What words would you say?" And he would talk about singing. He would talk about emotion. Uh, a lot. Um, a great story, and this is this is a really tough one for me to tell. So if I lose it, okay, I'll let you cut. <laughs> it was the day before the Utah Symphony audition, mm -hmm. and I think I played about nine hours the day before. And I called him. I got played. I said, if I only practice Beadlow for three more hours, it'll sound great. Mm -hmm. So I'm calling him. It's about nine o'clock at night. And I said, Mr. Jacobs, I'm in real trouble. I, said, I really want this job. I've never been so prepared in my life. I said I can barely buzz my lips. Mm -hmm. So I, I've just, I've overdid it. So I'm not going to be able to take this audition tomorrow. So I said to him, first he said, well, son, what would you do if you were going to take the audition tomorrow? I said, well, I need to be there at 9 o'clock, so I'd probably get up at 5. I'd probably play long tones for an hour. I said, no, 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 get a piece of paper and pencil. This is exactly what you're going to do. So, of course, you will run the paper and pencil. It's Arnold Jacobs on the phone. Mm -hmm. He says, you're, gonna, you're not going to play anything. You're not going to buzz. You're going to get to the hall. You can Play a couple notes on your C tuba. You're gonna play a couple notes on your F tuba to make sure everything is working fine. And you're gonna go sit down and take the audition. Mm -hmm. I said, Yeah, but I'm used to. No, you're. These are over warmed up. He said, They're just. They're tired. You don't need to overwork the muscles. Uh, so, you know, what do I got to lose? He's the man, you know. And uh, and he said, And you know what? He said, And you'll do a fine job on uh, on the Meister singing. You play that very well. And you'll do a fine job on. Uh, on the right of the Valkyries, he said, the one that's going to give you trouble is is, uh, is Mahler 1, because you're quite a uh, type A personality. Which he knew. And I said, uh, he said, so I want you to do something for me when you play Mahler 1. I said, well, what's that? You know, I said, write this down. I said, what's the saddest thing that ever happened in your life? Mm -hmm. And my father had just died. Mm -hmm. I said, my dad just passed away. Saddest thing. Loved him dearly. He said, before you play Mahler 1, I want you to think of your father and sing that song to him. Mm -hmm. So, you know, That's I mean, amazing. Even, even telling this is difficult. Absolutely, of course. So the first piece, I get on stage, the first excerpt is bead low. So, oh, goodness great. So I looked up Proxit, can I play a couple notes? And they, they wanted complete anonymity. He says, oh, I'll be the guy that plays the B-flat scale. Okay. Let's pick it up in the bead low. It went okay. So whew, turn the page. No, no. We want to hear the bead low again. Great. Played it a second time. It was a little better. Turn the page. It's the right of the Valkyries. Oh, goodness gracious. So now I got to, can I play a note on the C2? No. Play it called. So played it, and that went went well. Turn the page in the smaller one. So I'm thinking, you know, this is the one because I, you know, you get a little nervous and you start hearing, hearing as one of my colleagues says, start hearing Mahler one in thirty second notes. Da, 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 da. <laughs> We've all been there with the jaw starts yeah, to shake. Yeah. He says, Gary, just take a. So I'm thinking, what did Jacobs tell me? Take a deep breath, relax, and sing a song to your dad. I've never played it better than that. Wow. And I sat down. Wow. And again. Again, he's right. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. That's a great story. It's a true story. True story. I'm glad they didn't ask me to play it a second time, though. <laughs> but that's, that's the kind of influence that man was on, on myself and everybody. You know, the stories that uh, my other colleagues that I've talked to just have, have had the opportunity to work with Mr. Jacobs, they're, they're similar in vain. You know, how yeah. to, he, he knew how to address the issues that you had. Yeah. And he, he understood the player. And he, he told me... You know, a good teacher is someone who can speak to that student on their terms. So some students you have to be really tough with, other students you have to back off. What's going what's gonna to help them advance? What, what are the words you need to say to yeah. make them become a better musician? Yeah. And the other thing was, it was always, you know, people always talk about Jacob's, uh, you know, about the breathing and this stuff. With it. But the bottom line, it was all about the music with him. It was, it was always, music came first. Right. As he used to say, you can breathe with absolute perfection and be a lousy tuba player. Exactly. But so that's my, my Mahler one story and, and I and I won the job that day and, and I 
I attribute that success to him. Well, that's I'm really glad to get this on the yeah. on the video. Thanks. I'm for just glad that. I didn't cry. <laughs> it's a tough one. It's a tough one to Puddles tell. Puddles would have had a, he has a behind here. He has Kleenex for you. Oh, that's good. Were, that's so, very yeah. good. Yeah. Gary, you, you you started studying with uh, Mr. Jacobs in the '60s, and uh, you you would come whenever you come home to Chicago, uh, for, for whatever reason you hear the symphony and you go see Mr. Jacobs, so that was several times a year, yeah. um, up until when he passed away. Did you happen to, was there a shift in his pedagogical approach that you noticed, or was it the same? I don't think there was as much a shift in his pedagogical approach as much as there was a shift of how he treated me. Mm -hmm. Because by that, now later I was playing professionally, yeah. and he approached things differently with me. He was, uh, I think he was fussier with the product, you know. Uh, uh, he, he treated me, which wasn't the case, but he treated me like an equal in a way, mm -hmm. which was I was honored. They said, you know, you're professional, we're all the same now. It's, it's not, you're not, not a young high school boy or college boy. I mean, mm -hmm. he, and he, so he treated me differently in that regard. But it was, I remember one time I, he, I, he said that I could call him. I always call him Mr. Jacobs. He said, you know, Gary, you're far enough along your career. You can call me Jake. And I said, I physically can't do that, sir. You'll always be Mr. Jacobs to me. Mm -hmm. Harvey Phillips was always Mr. Phillips to me. Mm -hmm. And then he, Mr. Phillips said the same thing. Gary, just, just call me Harvey. I said, no, I, I can't do that. That's never going to happen, sir. Yeah. You know? <laughs> then he said to me, he said, yeah, you know, I, I called Mr. Bell, Mr. Bell his whole life, too. So it was always Mr. Jacobs. But as far as the way he, um, as far as his teaching was for me, and, and like I said, he, he really fine-tuned his teaching for that student at the moment. Right. And I didn't feel there was much, much difference. The priorities were always the same. It was always about, always about the art form. It was always about the music. Um, what do you need to do to get your brain out of it? And in fact, one of the things I, I write in my music, and these weren't his exact words, but uh, uh, one of his exact words, I should say, was, was which so many students don't do nowadays. He said, Gary, you play with strength. You don't play the tuba with strength. You play with weakness. Weakness is your friend. Remember him saying that? Absolutely, strength is your enemy. Yeah, yeah. strength is your enemy. He, he, would, he would demonstrate, he said, okay, he would play something loudly. He said, now, if I took a video of me playing this, you wouldn't know if I'm playing pianissimo or if I'm playing triple forte, would you? And I said, no. He said, you don't grip, you don't play with strength. And he, it's weakness, it's airflow. So in my parts, when I, I feel like I'm getting a little bit nervous, I'll write three letters in there, R, F, and B. The R is for relax. Because if you don't relax, forget it. F is for focus. Because you can be relaxed as possible. If you're thinking about your girlfriend or your taxes or, or you're changing right. the oil on your car, you're not going to play well. Mm -hmm. And the B is for breathe. So whenever I, I get to a part, if I'm a little bit uptight on something, I write those, R, those three letters, boom, Arnold Jacobs comes into my brain. Mm -hmm. And if I do those three, the product will be fine. Any one of those is missing. If I'm relaxed and I'm focused but I'm not breathing, it's not going to happen. If I'm focused and I'm breathing, but I'm uptight, it's not going to happen. So I, I keep those three letters, and I tell my students, I say, if you see a Utah Symphony Partners RFB, I wrote that in there. So that's <laughs> relaxed, breathe, and focus. That's great. Uh, those are uh, really, really excellent words to remember, I think. And, you know, the interesting thing is, I think, uh, among some of the people I've talked with, um, the, 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 the weakness is your friend is a, is a bit of a mystery because they, in, sometimes they'll interpret that to be just like, well, you're just totally limp. And that's not what he was talking about. Exactly. Uh, you know, you're still engaged, and all, but it's just not having this, this tight gut, but having the, as he would say, the, the jelly belly and yeah. <sighs> blow air from the lips and, and mm -hmm. be that kind of weak. It's interesting that you mentioned blow air from the lips because I remember uh, Floyd Cooley talking about that because he was a big fan of Jacobs and, and one of his students and one of my mentors also, mm -hmm. hearing him play. Those are words he never used with me and I don't know why. I've asked other people the same question. He never said breathe from the lips and I, 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 I'm not really sure what he meant by that. But, you know, like I said, he would fine tune his teaching to that student. Right. Maybe that was something with me that wasn't a concern and there were other things I'm sure that he probably told me that he wouldn't, wouldn't tell to someone else. I think so. I think his, his pedagogy was really uh, situationally based mm -hmm. on who was with him in the room and, and what words needed to be said and mm -hmm. uh, were effective yeah. when said. Um, uh, uh, 
I wonder, did you uh, have a chance to play uh, a second tuba in CSO with Jake at all? One time, That's sort nice. of by accident, and uh, it was in Symphony Fantastique, and my parents were there, of course, and he and. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure this. I don't think I got paid for it. <laughs> uh oh, that's a million years ago, when I was in Civic, and um, we'd get to a section, and he'd say, "Oh, that's fine. So you don't have to play that. I'll play that." You know. So he would. would <laughs> I think I played the DS area and then the bum 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 bum. The very end of the last one. That was probably about it. <laughs> but the, the sitting next to him was. Uh, yeah. What did you notice uh, in that situation? Sitting in the on the stage with him, right next to him. I was in such awe that I, pro I, 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 don't, I don't remember being nervous. I just, it, it almost felt like a dream that you're mm -hmm. sitting next to, at that point, the greatest tuba player on the planet, in my opinion, and in many people's opinion. And I, I don't remember a lot about it other than the fact that, that I didn't realize an orchestra could play that loudly at that time. And the, the sound, I remember the sound, you know, Ed Kleinhammer, you know, Frank Crisofoli, Jay Friedman. Vince Chickowitz, who hired me for Northwestern at later on in yeah. his life, Bud Herseth, Bill Scarlett, you know, Oldberg on second horn, mm -hmm. uh, Dale Clevenger was probably in his twenties at the time, maybe maybe late twenties. Just hearing these people play and, and and basically complete disbelief that I'm getting the chance to sit on that stage. And when I played with Civic, getting to sit on that stage it was always such an honor. Yeah, I agree. Oh. Well, yeah. Gary, what a what a treat it is to be able to connect with you. Here well, this is an Chicago. honor for me. Thank you. It's it just reminiscing about Mr. Jacobs. We could probably sit here with a group of people and do this for weeks. I There's so, so many wonderful stories, and you're such yeah. a wonderful, wonderful man who's changed so many lives. And I hope that, like yourself and myself, that we can pass these things along All right. to our students and their students and their students. Exactly. Because otherwise, and I'm so glad you're doing this, because these things need to be told, and they, they can't get lost. It's been a really interesting project, I have to say, and, uh, and it, it began on one path and quickly shifted to this, this, uh, this current path, and it's really been uh, very, very, a very big blessing. Mm -hmm. um, but Puddles would like me to uh, uh, present you with these premium, genuine, University of Oregon duck malted balls Excellent. Uh, for your enjoyment. So uh, as a thanks, uh, a thanksgiving for your participation. So thanks a lot, Gary. Thank you. My pleasure. Absolutely. And uh, enjoy in good health. I appreciate these it. These malted balls. <laughs> All right. And now back to you.